Good evening. Welcome to the third episode of In The Metal Live, which is a behind the scenes, hands-on scene of the independent watchmaking sector, and uh, where we talk to some of the most interesting people behind some of these brands, the watchmakers, the, the movers that make these things happen, and so we can get talking about the, these watches in more detail than you probably hear anywhere else. And to uh, at my good buddy on my right hand side here uh, in North Carolina, I would like to welcome uh, former Anthrax lead guitarist, now present day master watchmaker based in the USA, setting up his own workshop, who has set up his own workshop and is bringing his, out his first hand manufactured American made watch and it hasn't been done in generations. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Dan Spitz. I hope your microphone is working, Dan. One, two. Hello, everybody. Hey, Johnny, what's going on, my friend? Hey, Dan, it's great to see you again. Not too bad. Not too bad. So, uh, How's the green beer yeah. over there? <laughs> yeah. We're not getting much beer, I can tell you, but uh, there might be one after this, I can tell you. But uh, Hey, you'd think after three episodes I'd be an old professional now, but just uh, really fluffed that intro, like you know. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's nerd, like, all good. Know. It's all good. We're uh, we're laying a good a good platform of information that people will be able to tap into for many years to come. I hope, and that's kind of the goal here. It's not a flash in a pan or an instantaneous. Uh, oh, this is cool. Let's talk to this guy. It's more about uh, what we're trying. What me and Johnny, as a team, are trying to do. Johnny's a very famous writer for for all kinds of uh, watch magazines. One, yeah, clean the. Um, <laughs> so if you don't know who Johnny is, he he's he's an incredible person. Also behind the scenes, coming out front, and I wouldn't have partnered with anyone uh, of a lesser quality. He's a, a good man. But anyway, let me write. Hey. This. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring some information, and not just from watchmaker, independent watchmakers, as we've done in the first two episodes but other movers and shakers who pressed through and had some kind of very uh, um, incredible story, a life-changing story, uh, a passion for watchmaking and have broken through to do other things within the industry, uh, which will bring us uh, our, our incredible guest uh, today. And you'll all find it interesting, you know, collectors, um, you know, I'll be talking to collectors, it, you know, obsessed collectors, of course, not normal collectors, like the, the way out, cuckoo, cuckoo hey, for the dudes. So that kind of stuff, yeah. and it's real. What we have is real here. Nobody else has this, nobody else can, because I just really don't give a fuck what questions I ask, because I don't have to answer mm -hmm. anybody. So you're never gonna get this anywhere else, you're just gonna get corporate bullshit. So part of my language, <laughs> if, you, if you're not into that, you know, the language that, you know, um, I used to live on a tour bus, and it's just part of my inert quality. <laughs> Some things are, you know, inescapable. And uh, but here, you know, we're uh, we're all grown ups. And uh, I heard somebody say a bad word once, and uh, they still live. So uh, it's <laughs> we, we can go with that. No bother. So um, so yeah, I think what we've got here, uh, Danny, is something that is really unique in that it is. Uh, it's, a, it's it's uncensored. It's unrestricted. It's you know we we can talk to. The, People who look, we, we know most of them well so far. I'm sure right. we're going to be talking to a lot of people who will be just getting introduced to. And uh, but it's it's informal, it's chill, it's relaxed. And we hope that we make our guests feel comfortable. Are you feeling comfortable, Mark Sparks? <laughs> of of course, I'm. Hi guys, how are you? How you doing, Mark? <laughs> good, good. Good evening, bro. Well, well I just like to yeah, introduce you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to introduce Mark. Mark is the co-founder of this an extraordinary watch brand called Bob. And Mark's story is completely different to virtually anybody else in the watch industry. He has not grown up as a, a generation after generation of uh, watchmaking in the family where he's been brought up on his grandfather's knee at the watch, watchmaker bench. Mark went and pursued a completely different career, in fact, a couple of them, and just decided at one point, you know what, and uh, it was time for a change. And so Mark has uh, come, uh, reinvented himself in the same way as Dan has re rebirthed himself as a master watchmaker, 
And uh, he's introduced this incredible brand called Vault. And we're going to get talking about Vault and the story behind it tonight. So welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's a pleasure being on the, on the show. Brilliant. So, Mark, uh, as Johnny kind of brought everyone up to speed a little bit here, uh, I think it's best we, we explain to everyone. First, are you in Zurich? Is that where, where you are at the present time? Yeah, that's, that's right. I'm based near Zurich. Um, it's actually not far away from the airport, which is pretty good in normal times. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's about uh, half an hour away from Zurich. Okay. So we have Ireland, USA, and Zurich uh, online here today. And Mark, from what I understand, used to be a police officer. Uh, you'll fill us in on that, and a Swiss police officer for many, many yes, years. Sir. And just like me, an abrupt, you know, probably woke up one day. He'll tell us, though, but I'm going to guess a little bit. Probably, you know, just woke up one day when, and turned his passion into his, well, we could call it a business, but it really isn't. When someone takes on the role of bringing their dream into the forefront of their life and, and giving it all and risking it all, I don't really think it's a business. It, it really is kind of like what I do. It's, it's a passion. He just has to take a different route because he doesn't want to take the, the minimum of 10 to 20 years to become a watchmaker and then go on from there. And, um, you know, and there, and, you know, he, he, you got to give it all. And if you're married and, uh, your significant other is not behind you, that that's really difficult. If she's very behind you, makes it a little easier, but it's not easy. And some of the behind the scenes, behind the scenes, behind the scenes is what I'm trying to bring out in all aspects of our talks with different people from around the world. And not to show, not just to show that some rich dude with a whole bunch of 50, hundred million dollars at his disposal at any given cost, or usually his son is the, is the given Swiss story, you know, trudges over to Switzerland because they want to start a watch brand and just to have some fun because they got nothing to do because life on their yacht is just too boring. And we get these stories all the time. Just so you all know, you'll see hundreds of watch brands come and go. And the Swiss just love that because they come over with a lot of money and spend a lot of money trying to make a watch and they just don't know what they're doing. You can't do it that way. The bottom line is they'll never last. They love them. That's not part of independent watchmaking. That's part of stupidity as far as I'm concerned. But it's part of our industry, just like any other industry where there's manufacturing. Uh, Mark is the complete opposite of that. Mark has a passion beyond passion. And he's managed a way to snivel his little sniveling ways through to find people like we had on last week. Mark, Jenny, and Andrea Estrella, who are the top of the top of the top of the top uh, watchmakers. I don't even beyond watchmakers. Um, yeah. dream, dream, dreamers make it happen. Dudes uh, behind the scenes, behind the scenes for many independent brands and other brands as well. Uh, wh when you need something that can't be done, you know, you go to Andreas, you go to Mark, and somehow Mark pulled this off here, and I want to know how. <laughs> so Mark, tell, well, tell we, us who you've arrested. Know, who, who you've arrested? You better not have arrested any metal dudes. So I'm fucking cutting <laughs> you off right here. Uh, to, uh, to be honest, no, that, that that's why I didn't arrest. <laughs> <laughs> so fill us in a little bit, Mark. I I I I I've raised you up on this pedestal now, so don't let yourself down, bro. <laughs> no pressure well, there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, your question, it, it, it's a great one to start. And actually, to be honest, if I look back, it's somehow, um, it's hard actually to, to believe what, what happened. Um, uh, all in all, from, from the, the, the beginning where I actually, um, when I set to, to create this brand and the people, the incredible people we have met on the way, it's been, it's been, it's been an incredible journey. And it actually sounds a bit like a, like a dream, actually. Um, so if, if we go back to, I would say, um, Basically, it all started off in my childhood when I got my first flick flack from my from my parents. That was like when I got introduced to, to watches. That was the way I learned how to how to read a watch, how how a watch actually works. And fascination started for watches and moved on to let's say like the, the more ordinary brands, which we all know, and which I quickly got bored of. And, and it was it was basically um, I started to to fall down that 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 steep slope of independent watches and and mad creations which I was far more interested in 
Um, but I pursued a completely different, uh, different path, a career path. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, um, I wasn't a rock star. Uh, I was, I was an electrician. Then moved on to the police. Uh, worked for the police for six years in different positions, which was an incredible school of life. That's something which I really wanted to do. Um, really enjoyed it, but I had. Um, also, tough times there. I, I was, uh, I, I experienced a couple of life and death situations, which, which was actually like the starting point for what we created or why Walt is actually, um, why Walt exists. Because when you, when you get into such situations, you find out the hard way how, how short life can be. Uh -huh. You find out quickly, fast that that time is the most precious uh, thing you have. Um, and that was where I started to think, okay, what do I actually really want to do with the time I've got? And what is the most pleasing thing to do with the time you have? And it was a combination of actually looking back to my childhood. I loved playing with Lego. It was like, I went absolutely crazy. I could like go on for the whole weekend, build cars, planes, whatever. And you got into this state of flow where you just, you forget time, you forget literally everything. You just want to move on. And I wanted to combine that with my passion for watches and create a brand which is not about timekeeping, but about time itself and how precious time is. So that was like the idea. But uh, let's be honest, I mean, a lot of people have got ideas. And usually what you do is you drink up your beer and you say, OK, let's let's move on and do something else because it's not going to work, isn't it? Because I'm not a watchmaker, haven't got the money for it, um, just didn't have. Um, I didn't have a team, didn't have the connections. so it's basically hope, hopeless isn't it, to, to actually to think about it but somehow it just um it, it just i couldn't get it out of my head and um at some point my idea started to really um to really become far more than just an idea but actually a desire to 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 create my own brand um but who is who so who is the first person that you ran into you had the dream you're walking around you know, you're still driving your golf, probably. Uh, you know, and the police. I park. actually had the golf. I had a golf <laughs> TGI. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, just, you're, you're you're a I, I had a feeling. Um, <laughs> you know, and who was the first person you met that just said, "I could take you to at least the next level"? I have an idea for me to introduce you to this gentleman because let me explain to people that don't know, that aren't collectors and so on, that might be listening here. Um, you can't just start a watch brand. Okay, you need a whole shitload of money beyond a shitload of money, mm -hmm. and beyond the money, um, you know, you usually ninety nine point nine percent of the time, you have to go to Switzerland, and there's a minimum of eight year, approximately developmental waiting list to do something basic. What Mark's got behind him and on his wrist over there is beyond outer space shit. All right, for all you normal dudes that don't know what I'm talking about, it's insanity. So to get someone to agree to do that without uh, um, you know, having an extra 20, 30 million dollars, it's just not going to happen. So somehow, you know, Mark's driving around in his golf and figured out a way. And that's what I find ex extremely amazing in this story. So if you could just, I want to know that first person that, that, that gave you hope where you were about to, you know, I'm done with this. It's not going to happen. Who was that dude? Um, actually, someone who, who is also not from the watch industry. Um, when I when I came up with the idea, it was actually back in, in 2013 in a beer garden in Munich. I had a couple of beers. My spouse was there. We were talking. At some point, actually, it was it really, it might sound a bit incredible, but that that's what happened. On that evening, uh, on, no, sorry, it was, it was the afternoon. Um, I was sitting there having a drink, and I was always constantly thinking about how could I make a watch which would represent the vision of creating um, mechanical art, which is not about timekeeping primarily, but actually about time itself. So my idea was it would have to include a movement which you cannot interact with. Um, so it, the movement actually would stand for time itself. And as we know, we cannot control time. So what we would do is we would basically use a movement which you can rotate and you can rotate the dial and that's the way you would be able to set the time without interacting with the movement um and that was that was the idea so um so it was the dark like so wait so let me get this straight i'm not cutting you off or nothing bro it, so it wasn't a human it was the beard that did it <laughs> <laughs> Probably. it's it, always it, the it, beard, right 
<laughs> it, it's always it's always bo it's just always alcohol isn't it I mean, <laughs> look i've got i've got a backup um drink here as well yeah, in, in yeah. case i need it um no, so, are you planning so, the second um, watch now with that wine is that what that is sorry are you planning the second watch today by yeah, drinking the yeah. wine? That, that's how you have to. That's how you have to. That, that's the creative <laughs> yeah. process, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. so that was like the first step to actually to to have a concept, and, and then based on that, because I didn't have any contact to a watchmaker or to the watchmaking industry, my first contact was um, was a good friend of mine, um, Philip Schmid, who is an engineer. But actually, his engineering skills are with huge cogwheels and huge parts because he worked um, for, for a Swiss a train company at, at the time. And I met up for uh, another beer with him and I started to, to explain to him what I actually want to do. I told him, look, I've got this idea and I want to create a watch. <clears throat> and yeah, he basically looked at me, oh, are you nuts? I mean, how shall we do it? And I, I, I was able to convince him that, um, that I believe that we could at least it will be a fun project. Let's do a couple of sketches. Let's see where, where, where we get to and what we could do together. And we, we really started from basically from scratch. We did, we did drawings. We didn't know how watches actually work. So we had to look up a lot of stuff online. Um, and that went yeah. on for like about one and a half years, approximately, until, until we, had, yeah, we, had, we had a concept. Yeah, at this point, Mark, can I just ask you, did you have a picture, a vision? In your mind's eye, of what the Vault V1 was going to look like? Did you have any idea what it was going to look like? Did you like? Is the finished product? Uh, could you see how that has evolved from your earliest sketches, or has it become taken a completely different direction to become what what, what you have created there? Yeah. Um, it was, it was, the, the first sketch was pretty pathetic. I mean, I've, I've, um, sometimes I do, I do, um, keynotes and I show that picture and I usually, I just say, look, you have to start somewhere. So mm -hmm. I sketched the watch. It was, it was already like a square, um, a square, um, rectangular shaped, um, case with the movement inside. So I was able to do that, but actually from, from the starting point until we got to the final watch. Um, the, the, the design has evolved. What I knew was the basic concept. I knew the, the, the basic idea behind the watch, what, what I want to achieve. And I knew what type of watches I love um, and how, in which direction it has to go. Yeah, but, but, Mark, but no, from, a, from a watchmaker standpoint, what I'm asking is, who is the first watchmaker you ran into who set you straight and looked at your drawings? Because we see them all the time from people who have visions. Um, but obviously they haven't lived inside micro mechanics for 10, 20, 30 years or had to develop, you know, the developmental expertise, uh, which is totally yeah. different because lots of people come to me with, I've got this dream and I got backers and, you know, if you can make this happen and to, to do just what I'm doing here for myself, and that's for myself. It's, you know, it's been over three years here and four years of development of my escapement. So who woke you up and said, you're, you're nuts, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Dan. Literally, everyone I was talking to um, told me that. Uh, until one guy actually said, "Hey, wait a minute. I know, I know a watchmaker who might be able to help you out." And um, that uh, that was actually the starting point to get a meeting with Andrea Strela. And uh, back in 2014, in um, autumn, that was. Uh, two young, ex unexperienced but but highly motivated guys were sitting in his office, sitting together with, with one of the big watchmakers, um, and and tried to convince him that we have came up with something which which the watchmaking world has never seen before. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously his um, his first impression was, what do these two crazy guys want in here? It's like. They must be mad. I mean, they're not from the watch industry. They've got no no clue. Um, and we actually we went we went in there and uh, we had our, our um, CAD models which we created and we we had a lot of um, pictures we printed out and we showed to him. And what we were proposing was was actually um, probably even more bonkers because we came up with a, with a, a double clutch gear system which was actually in, inspired by by the gti i had um, back then 
uh, which included 200 components in the crown, in, inside the crown, which was a clutch system where he could choose between actually rotating the movement and, and, and the dial. So as you can see, in, in a CAD model, you can, you can do everything. Mm -hmm. You can do small parts, doesn't matter. We were actually asking him if that would be possible. Right. And um, yeah, it turned out it's not possible. It's just, it wouldn't work. Um, but fundamentally, that was, um, it was an incredible um, meeting because at the beginning he thought, no, this, this is not going to work. Um, but the longer the, the conversation actually went on, the more he really got into it. He started to do some research and, and yeah, basically said, hey, this hasn't been done before. Um, right. He was quite surprised. And then we had so what, what quite I'm a clear say, idea. What I'm going to say now, Mark, is as, as, we have similar brains, most of the watchmakers that I meet, no matter what language they speak or wherever I am in the world and sit next to or whoever I want to learn from or, or teach to. Um, it's, it's similar to music. You could always learn from someone. And same with music. If someone comes along with a wacky idea first, we're like, you're, you're fucking out of your mind. But if it's, if it's a challenge and it hasn't been done, we love challenges because mm -hmm. uh, um, we love challenges. Days get boring, uh, micro mechanics. It hasn't been done. Let's see if it hasn't been done. Let's let's take that to the next level. So what I'm trying to show to other people that might be out there, such as yourself, who have a dream and a, and you know a drawing on a napkin. That's how many of the world's greatest inventions have happened. And you just got to find that that one person that I was getting at who connects that dots and helps you and believes you when you're a little teeny band and he just believes in you. He sees that one little thing that no one else sees that everyone sells says you're, you're, you're crazy and your music sucks, but he believes in you. And that really can bring you all together as a group, find the next person to fill in the next dot and make that reality, you know, a reality, tone it down, perfect it. Um, you know, don't have 709 parts as for the crown, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing. But really, you know, get into it and you all become a passionate team and it is possible to do this insanity, because people people out who are watching now, Mark, really, they think you just made a watch. They haven't seen your timepiece and how it runs yet. So don't go, don't tune out. You'd be an idiot if you did, because what Mark is holding yeah. and what Mark has produced and what Mark already is, is in production uh, is is crazy for someone who is just, you know, was was driving around in a golf in golf cop car. It's it's mind blowing. So. The premise is you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. If you're a watchmaker or want to be a watchmaker, you can do that. But you can also be like Mark, and you're going to learn a lot. Mark is an incredible person and what he's accomplished and even it being in Switzerland and to convince Andre Estrella, you're not a watchmaker and I have this crazy idea. You know how many, you know how many watchmakers go to Andre Estrella and say, I have a crazy idea? And he says yeah. no. So that's why this story is extremely intriguing. Um, to the world, and, and there's a lot of firsts inside your movement, and I really do think it needs to get a, a lot more, a lot more awareness in the independent watchmaking field because it's not just your movement. Um, the whole, just so you all know, the whole movement turns inside the case while it's on shock absorbers inside the case, and the case is not normal. We'll get to that and talk about the construction and the composites of, of Mark's case. He didn't just stop at his wackiness. For, uh, um, for, for the movement itself. And this is a ground up movement, just like I'm doing here, people, a ground up movement. And, and, and it's, it, it's an accomplishment that really needs to be in the forefront of independent watchmaking. Because there's many facets of what we are, what we do. Yes, I'm an independent watchmaker. Yes, Johnny's an independent watchmaker writer, you know, one of the best. Without Johnny, who's, you know, yeah, we have our own platforms, right, Mark? We have YouTube, we have Instagram and all. We all have our own TV stations now and all that kind of stuff that I didn't have when I grew up for music. We had to go out there on the streets and put out flyers. But Johnny is yeah. part, part, part of that. Without Johnny, you know, writing for us um, on a corporate level somewhat, let's say, sometimes, we're sunk too. It's, it's, we're all a family behind the scenes here, and I'm trying to let everyone in on these unsung heroes. And uh, Mark, your story 100%. Is, is, is so compelling, man. And, and for people who don't know who Andre Estrella is, um, Andre Estrella is not a little watchmaker, again, on the hill of Lombrasus on the top of the mountain in a little woodshed and says, I can do this. Wait, let me have my afternoon tea. Andre Estrella is a badass, and he's got a badass uh, uh, giant Willeman uh, CNC machines, and he can produce your dream in his 
it's it's a it's an incredible facility. So if he took this on and and you know he he saw something that was magnificent, and, and yeah, it really I think is. Dan, what, what, I think Dan, what, what he really saw was two guys who are absolutely dead serious and who, who were working for for years on it. And actually, um, and I think a lot of credit I want to also give give to to Philip Schmidt because he he was able to. I think together we were able to to acquire that much knowledge over over one and a half years that, for example, the whole planetary gear system, which which makes sure that the dial numbers never stand upside down, that was all calculated in the, in the, in the first place by, by, by Philip Schmid. So a lot of work already went in, and I think that, that's what, um, what really convinced um, Andreas to, to team in, because he saw they are really serious about it. It's not just some kind of um, joke. They, they they put in everything they've got. They they they've already got right pretty far. Even though obviously there was there was still a huge way to go, and there was um, we had to like completely redesign and re-engineer everything. But I think what he saw there was the principal um, concept was already standing, and 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 that what that's what was really impressed him. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's an independent watchmaker, just just like the rest of us. He's just on a, a little larger scale because an independent watchmaking. So you all know there's people that are independents that we need to source certain parts to make. Uh, uh, we'll take a base plate from a movement, uh, say it's an ETA 6498, because we don't have the opportunity to have the money or the know-how or the skills to have our own CNC machines to make our own main plates nowadays. An extremely costly uh, adventure, and I mean just even after you buy the machines, if you get yourself a current, the electricity per month is, is astronomical. So you have to have the business to pay your electricity bill to have the current because you can't shut it off at night and just have things humming, you know, and start up in the morning. They're temperature controlled and so on and so forth. So it's someone like Andreas goes beyond just, I want to make my own watch. Andreas is helping other people and, and not just other watchmakers, but he's helping people like Mark not just have his dream come true, but make an impact on what independent watchmaking truly is and truly stands for. It's multifaceted and it's art. It's we can make our art from a napkin come true. You don't have to like my art. You know, someone once told me when I was playing music, because my music was obviously quite different than everything else that was out there when we started. You know, you're not, not the typical one. You're not gonna please everybody in the world, little boy. It's not that. It's Who if, you, if you can please less than 1%, if less than 1% of who you talk to like what you're doing with your art, you're, you're, you're doing really well. Cause there's a lot, of, there's, there's billions and billions of people out there. You're gonna get the guy that says, that is the ugliest piece of shit I've ever seen. That song is the worst piece of shit. I can't even tap my foot to that boy. You know, you're gonna get all that. Don't listen to it, it's noise. That, that guy wishes he could draw on a napkin and make it where you are today. So be nice and kind to the gentleman he's not for your art it's art i could look at someone who's an artist artist you know there's people that don't like salvador dali end yeah. of story yeah it's so a good point a analogy because it actually is art go ahead johnny yeah it, it, it's a perfect analogy because that's what you, you, you're thank you for your kind word to a few minutes ago guys uh, and the, the reason they do specialize in the independent sector is because I, I really find it fascinating. Uh, once I discovered this world of independent uh, watchmaking, where the, the level of commitment and passion and determination and often heartbreak that was into creating a watch, from the, the finishing of it, from the, uh, the, the actual engineering, the, the micro engineering that's involved in it, I realized that this was something that was. was I had never seen the like of this before. And what also struck me about it was that it's fundamentally unchanged in centuries. That the thing that the, the whole philosophy of horology, of watchmaking, the same fundamentals, as you said, uh, Dan, last week, the machinery that you have amassed around you is decades old and it, it's. It, it, it comes from another time, but it's still very relevant. And these are the tools that are being used today to manufacture these extraordinary pieces. Now, I know that with Urteil and with Andres Streller, who is the, the, the 
master watchmaker behind the, the, the mechanism within the evolved watch. This revolving uh, movement that's completely is gear wheels everywhere. We'll, we'll hopefully get a look at it shortly anyway, Mark. But this is an art form. This is expression. And this is what, this is what hooked me and took me away from the, the mainstream, the big brands, the, the bright lights, to these guys that are working on their own and um, often on their own. Right, because um, someone like I, I was trying to get across to perhaps business people out there uh, who are collectors. This is a very interesting episode because, you know, we have sitting with us Mark who – who is kind of, he's, he's one of you, but he made it happen. So it is possible. But what we should be striving for, and what I'm trying to show, is in independent watchmaking, there shouldn't just be an Andreas Streller in Switzerland. You know, there really should be another one here in America. There should be one in Japan who has the capabilities not just to make his own timepiece, but to help others who might not uh, um, be a, a watchmaker and be an, you know, go through what I've gone through in the many years to get where I am, um, but have their dream come true. Help one person, you know, if you help that one person achieve his dreams, it'll come back, you know, it's, it's giving love to the world, but that love will also come back to you, you know. Um, you know, I hope I can do that here in America as well. You know, I, I know I want to bring in some young watchmakers uh, once, once this gets to level two, let's say, to not just have them sit next to me while and produce my timepiece, it's more um, like uh, Roger W. Smith does for his country. You bring them in, you let them stay. You want to stay a week, want to stay a month, stay, stay two years, learn what you have to learn. But you know what? When you're not working, this shop, these machines, everything is yours. Go do your art. Create your art. Mm -hmm. And when your art and your first piece is done and you sell it, take that money and you want to leave now and buy your first machines and move on. You can still come back here. You know, even though you left, you get stuck, come yeah. back and push forward independent watchmaking in all facets. And I find that that's, you know, we, we have to be that way. This is not, it's, it's got to stand for the opposite of corporate crap and guys in suits and ties. It goes against all the rules. It's, it's thrash metal. That's what independent watchmaking needs to be. And Mark, it broke, is, it, Mark it, it, all those rules. No, he's it, it impresses me because there's other people that have, have done this and you know they just make a basic movement or whatnot. Mark, maybe you do want to show what you you know some of the facets of of the vault now, maybe a little bit to show people it's insane. it's crazy what he's accomplished. It really is. And 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 last our last week's guest, Mark Jenny, you know, has to do a, um has done a lot of work with you as well, from what I understand, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's a great watchmaker as well, a good friend, and uh, and and somebody who has been who has been super supportive as well in 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 the last couple of years. So, um, I think that's that's one of the one of the key um, aspects is that we've just been able to build a great team. For example, as our designer Laura Oberso, who who designed it, um, who designed the Vault Watch, is just he's he's incredibly talented. He already worked together with uh, with Andreas with numerous other brands. And um, yeah, I think that, that that's been the biggest um, achievement to get all those talented people together to to work on 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 a common vision. That's been that's been the big the big part of it. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to show you the the, the watch um, in, in a bit more detail because I think it is true that on pictures sometimes it's hard to actually to appreciate what what's going on in this watch. And I think the easiest to to start is actually before I'm showing the watch, I'll just show you a couple of components which um, which make up um this this special watch and the way it works so what we use um in inside of of, of our cases is, is is a mono cage I'm, I'm a bit of a car guy so um, i'm pretty pretty inspired also by by uh, by cars and what we what we did is we we created um, a titanium mono cage which holds the main components um, inside of the watch and that's something which also stands out or, or is something which um, which andreas puts a lot of um, uh, um, focus on is is the way you actually create a watch. So it has to be um, easy to maintain. It has to be easy to assemble in, in, in terms of being able to make sure that you don't scratch the case and all that. So that's a big thing. Um, second is here you've got our, our, um, our base plate of the movement. And what this actually does, it, it's, not, um, it's not assembled to the mono cage, but what we do is 
it is placed inside of the mono cage and then you can rotate the whole movement inside here so it's not connected at all it, it actually rotates in here and it's kept in place with three springs which push down on the main plate and on the back side you've got steel rollers which i'm going to show on on the other watch afterwards so you've got six steel rollers which make sure that it smoothly can can operate and run inside here so that's the that's the first part um the second part is what you can see here is um the again the mono cage and on top we've got this this x bar um, X bridge mount in the middle and on top is the dial and the dial the whole dial co um, mechanism uh, consists of 133 pieces only for for the dial and to, to display the, the hours and what this does is it rotates on top and based on the planetary gear system it makes sure that the numbers never stand upside down so those are like the main two components. And if you think about it, you've got 133 parts just for the dial mechanism, and you've got, you've got over 200 parts for the movement. And now, as I explained in the beginning, you have got a watch where you don't operate um, the hands on the movement or interact with the movement directly, but what you do is you turn the dial and the movement at different speeds. So how can you set a, ta a watch without, um, without interacting with the movement? And for that, we're quickly gonna change to to the V1 plus titanium, which I've got here. What you actually do is um, the whole system of, of the planetary gear um, dial has got a speed reduction inside, which makes sure that the dial only rotates at 11 twelfths of, of a revolution while the movement rotates, um, uh, makes a whole rotation. And that's the way you can actually read the time. So let's, let me, t tell me if you can, if, you, if it's, um, if it's focused enough. That's good right there. Well, good. Yeah, good. So, so what you can see now, just quickly set to the full hour, what you've got now is, is nine o'clock. So how do you actually read the time on this watch? You've got um, conventional minute hand, which you can read like every other watch. That was really important for us so that you, you usually know which minute um, or if it's quarter past or half past the hour. So that has to be really easy to read. And the second part is you can see here the dial. You can see nine o'clock is highlighted here. It's a bit brighter than the other numbers. Yeah. And that's that's a dial which I showed before. Now in front of the dial, you've got a sapphire crystal disc, um, which has got um, a fade on it, like, like a, a, a dark printing on it. And that consists of 330 different lines, which which Andreas actually had to had to um, had to design in the CAD model. So he had to change the spacing, the the the, the, the widths of, of the lines to make it look like a gradual fade. The idea there was to uh, to emphasize that we that what we can see if you look at time, we we can see that the current is like crystal clear. That's why you can see the current hour, but we cannot um, see into the future. We can we look into the future or we, we try to look at the future that's why you've got this general fade but everything which is past is like that that's blocked and gone that's why it's dark at the back side beautiful beautiful now when, and now when you start to rotate they are now rotating the dial and, and the movement is rotating at different speeds now um and the next position as the dial is a bit slower is is 10 o'clock and then if yeah. you turn further 11 o'clock and you can you can see here on the back side how the whole movement uh, rotates as well that's badass that's that's badass <laughs> it really yeah. is one of the things about the the v1 uh, is that no two so if, if you have two guys in the same room at five minutes past five and they both look at their v1 watch each one of them will present the time differently yeah. to the exactly. other. So exactly, it, Johnny. It, it, as these the planetary gears, the, the, the numerals are rotating. Once you're winding the watch, the numerals are rotating. Once you're setting setting the watch, your numerals are rotating. You put your crown in, and that fixes the, the yes. numerals in that unique position. And then your sapphire crystal with the graduated fading it's rotating and it's as as nine o'clock becomes the moves into ten o'clock the fading passes over the nine 
making, putting it in the darkness and more or less, not illuminating, but highlighting, accenting the next number, yeah. the 10. It's absolutely extraordinary what sort is. Yeah, that's what I said. I don't think people understand the complexity because there, I think people who maybe have seen a picture of this timepiece in the past, um, um, when you were when you were first presenting it to the press and so on and so forth, they just think it's a dial that rotates. Uh, it, it, this is beyond, and you know, it, it's it's incredible what what you have accomplished here. When you turn it over, that puts it all into perspective. And what what is very interesting is, I'll keep coming back to is, on top of the movement is turning. Try to think of this, people. The movement is turning, and it's shock. It's shock mounted at the same time. So that's kind of mind boggling if you think about it, because usually if you think about shock mounting a movement, you think uh, uh, you're going to put, you know, four kind of four suspension type of suspension systems in four quadrants and that's it. It's it's suspension mounted, you know, um, but you you went got, you guys went about it a completely different way and pulled it off. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, because it's, this, this, for an example, there's also no winding stem, which which is which is integrated right. to to the to the movement. So that's it's it's completely free inside. And I think it's important to emphasize that that, that the movement in a Walt watch represents time itself, which we cannot control. And the fact that every watch looks different represents the fact that we all have got a different perception of time. And the magical thing about it is that that Dan, for example, um, if I would fly over to you, I would I would based on when I reset the time and in which time zone I am, the watch is going to look different. And it constantly evolves based on how I wear it, my lifestyle. So it's a bit like, I like to compare it like you would you buy an old school blank diary. It's an unpersonal item, but as soon as you actually start to write in it, it becomes personal. And that's the same here. The reason why it looks like it looks is because when you set your watch and in which time zone you are. Right, and I know you do personalizations as well as as the, for each uh, for each uh, customer. Yeah. yeah, so it really is yours. And I also want to clarify to people out there who might look at some of these independent um, artists uh, artists and say, "Oh, I can't read the fucking time. What fucking good is it?" Well, <laughs> listen, fuck you, because it's not about that. We've we've surpassed that. You got phone. You got time in your pocket on your little digital phone. There, fuck not. This is about <laughs> art. At this point in time, time, haha. It's art. What we're creating is is beyond time. Now we don't really need to show. You know, to have a wristwatch on our wrist like we like our grandparents did. You know, every human really did need it way back when. Uh, we're we're way beyond that. We're creating micro mechanical machines and micro mechanical inventions that uh, are mind boggling. And that's what this show is is going to show everyone that it's not eight gears in the standard little stem. Um, what we're, most of us are creating, we're way outside the box. Like my music was way back when, like thrash metal was, when you first heard it, it was way, way outside the box. It was not normal, it was not normal heavy metal. It was not a piece of this, a piece of that. And I copied you and I copied you. It was way off every map known to mankind. Um, that's what Mark is holding there. And, and it really need, you know, we need to represent this in independent watchmaking that uh, you can go to Japan and, and you know, you have, uh, um, what's his name, Masahiro Kikuno. I don't know how many watchmakers you follow, Mark. We have Masahiro in Japan. He decided, yeah. you know, I'm going to go way back in time because he went to a museum from what I understand and saw a certain clock and a certain complication. And he wanted to make that into, shrink it down and make it into a wristwatch because it hasn't been done. It's a, a, um, a way to tell the time in, uh, through the Japanese calendar. And, and he did it and he doesn't want to use any modern machines, but even go beyond that. He wants to use all the old techniques, not even sandblasting to, to put a matte finish on. He wants to, in a bucket, fill it with sand and pour the sand over the piece 7 million times until the piece looks the way, because that's how they did it in 1712. Mm -hmm. You know, so each one of us, that's his art. It, that yeah, is yeah. his art. You can tell him you're an idiot. It's could You could do this in 30 minutes with this machine <laughs> and it does, shouldn't take you three months. But you know what? He wants to make two or three watches. And then 10 years from now, what he's been doing repetitively over and over and over, he's perfected to that where it looks like it was done basically by the machine. So now he's a human machine. 
That's his art. And that's what you're yeah. buying. You're buying his story, but you're not, it's not a story. It's not bullshit. It's not, uh, oh yeah, we, we make a one of a kind watch and my name is you know from a corporate entity and they're, they're manufacturing this stuff and they're manufacturing the PR and the PR rooms and tricking you with smoke and mirrors bullshit. You know, in independent watchmaking, what you're getting is this person's blood, sweat, tears, what he gave up, what he risked. Not everybody makes it. And in fact, most don't. In the long run, in the long, in the long, 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 long run, they, they, they can't stick around. They might be here for two years, three years, five years, 10 years, something happens and, and they're out. Um, for someone that's been here a long time, you're really buying in to that person. You're supporting his art. Just like if you want to hang beautiful paintings in your beautiful home, um, you know, you, you might find an artist somewhere who's a little bit struggling and you buy his art for twenty, thirty thousand dollars But you know what? You didn't just buy his art. You supported him to make another one. Exactly. That, that, that's why we, for example, we only talk about patrons. We don't talk about, about uh, clients. These are patrons. They are buying a piece of the, of the brand. They're buying a piece of our company. And I think what we are doing and what artists do and what you do, Dan, as well, and Johnny, you and your, your way as well is, we are able to, to, to express ourselves through what we're doing. And I think that's, that's the beauty of, of, of watchmaking. It's, it's an expression. And I have to be honest, yes, it is, um, it, it, it's, it is pretty out of the box. But that, that's how I've been all my life. I've always been the person asking, why can we do it this way? Or I've, That's just how I am. And I think I've been able to express this through, through my watches. So yeah. it might be crazy for some, but, but that's just... It's the story. That's the way I think. We have to get those stories out there. That's what we're doing here. I mean, if I was to purchase one of your watches, Mark, I'd be wearing it. And every day, this should, I would have like requested on my personal one that there was a little button on the side that had your wife screaming at you. Because I know the story. Your wife had to be going, you're insane. You're nuts. How can you never going to make this happen? Oh, maybe you will. But if you will, you know, it would be great. Because that's, I know that behind the scenes through the years, you know, if she supported you or whatever, it, you know, you were nuts. You're insane. You're one of those yeah. that, that were crazy. And you made it happen. And you connected with some incredible, incredible people. Um, so tell I have to say she, she's like she's like the great support I could have, and I couldn't be happier because without I'm her, with you, bro. I wouldn't have been able to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm messing with you, man. Um, but listen, let's let's talk let's talk about something because there's other people listening that might be in, in your same shoes. They're like, man, I've been buying all these independent watchmaker stuff. I'm beyond that now. You know, I really somehow. I don't know how this is done. I don't want to, you know, waste my time. You know, but I do would would love to produce my own timepiece before I'm dead. Um, so what I'd like to talk, just briefly touch upon. I know it's a private area. Um, where and how did the funding come to get this off the ground? If you don't mind, you can say no. You don't. You know, yeah, we can no, go on to the next question. Yeah. You know, we all don't don't go totally into depth. You don't have to mention names or anything, but I think it's an interesting subject when it's not a wealthy person. It just has money at his disposal, can go just to the bank. And for all you people out there that are not Swiss, okay, in, within the Swiss borders, you can very pretty somewhat easily go to a Swiss bank where they actually understand that this is a massive industry with massive potential, and you can get loans. If you'd like to try it out here down the street in North Carolina, uh, yeah, <laughs> or here in Ireland, <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, the very common thing in Ireland is yeah. uh, the, I actually have been in the bank one time. We were getting uh, one of the, the one bounce of what I do off the ground, and uh, the guy just pulled out a phone and he said, "Like, you know, what what do I need a watch for?" Like, you know, yeah. and I used to this attitude, I this thought to myself. These guys think that they're sophisticated. They're the, the bank manager types, the deputy bank manager, and nothing wrong with those professions, but the guys were dri driving around in a you know, 70 grand BMW 5 series and wearing a $70 watch on their wrists, you know, and I do like- it's, 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 it is, it's, quite a, it's quite a struggle because someone who goes to school for say, to be a dentist here, not even, you know, not a doctor, a dentist. The second they come out of school or even before, they can go walk right in and get a, a loan to get all the machines they need, which is very expensive. 
their machines yeah. are just as expensive as our CNC machines and all our setup would be money to set up their office, their practice, just because they hold the diploma. Uh, being a watchmaker uh, takes way longer than that and way, way, way longer than that. And really these kind of loans should be available globally, even in these times for independent watchmakers, because their passion it goes beyond beyond the beyond. You, you, it's, it is, it can be a, a lucrative area for somebody's art. So anyway, Mark, I got sidetracked a little bit. Uh, funding, uh, so you found Andreas, you had Mark, I know Mark's on board, um, you have some names. You, we, we still need, even if Andreas and Mark said to you, I'll do it pro bono, we'll figure it out later when you start selling stuff, which is a lot of us do, that's the love part of it. Um, there still needs to be some form of funding for the people that are not within your circle. When you go out designing your case and you don't wanna give a person a portion of your sales, because you, you know we're not producing 500 watches a year here. That's not the goal. So fill us fill us all in a little bit from someone from your perspective who where you're at. Yeah, I think it's 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 important to um, that's a really important question because I I believe a lot of people if if they hear a story they think okay it all sounds pretty easy and the, there must have been some some money in in, in the family or whatever but fact of the matter is that. Um, that first of all, a big part was actually really also putting in putting in my own money. Um, what I did when I when I actually switched careers, um, I I went from 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 the police. I was fortunate enough to to make a switch to um, to the financial industry to banking because I I had um, I had opened up a startup before, uh, which which gave me an opportunity to actually to start in uh, working in a bank, and that was good for two reasons basically i was really able to to learn far more from from let's say from a business perspective knowledge i didn't have but also to to um to try and save up as much money as possible to to be able to to invest into the company um then of course like the founding partners they they invested into the company so so philip myself laura and and all together also also um um, Andrea Strela obviously helped a lot and I think what we really did or what was important and instrumental was that um, we were able to um, to apply uh, because I also went to um, to, uh, to business school I decided I'm going to go to business school and that actually gave me a huge huge advantage because first of all I actually hated going to school when I was, when I was a young boy but <laughs> in that case I really loved going there because on one side I had like my, my open book um, my school book and I have my other book, which was my vault book. So I could basically like suck in all the information which I can use and and, and apply that into the company. So in terms of strategy, um, all that stuff that was incredibly helpful because I knew from the start, um, as you said, Dan, there's, there's so much money you have to invest to get such a company going. You really have to find ways how you can make the most out of the money you have. Um, so that was incredibly important. And as I went to um, to business school, I was able to apply for um, it was it, it's basically um, a startup um, accelerator program here in Switzerland, which is called Venture Kick, which I can highly recommend for um, everyone who is basically starting a business in Switzerland and and needs help there. It's a three stage um, process, and they really helped us. They also challenged us. That was uh, incredibly important. And what I also did was, um, so, so we got, we got actually, it was the all three stages we were able to, to get the funding there, which, which was really important and, and helpful. And we were able to get a couple of other um, uh, investors on board. And I think what was additionally to that really important is we knew that we're never going to be really interested uh, in an interesting, um, uh, let's say, business partner from from a commercial point of view for for, for an example for a case developer or for um for all sorts of suppliers because we don't need a lot of pieces right so we teamed up with people who are like have got a like-minded can-do spirit and who are actually um who see vault as a platform where they can show what they're actually able to do so for an example our our um our case maker uh René Schrind, who, who who owns the company rgb um x tech here in switzerland he's he's as crazy as i am and, and he's incredibly good at what he's doing so he basically was was so into the idea that they said yeah i'm, I'm gonna work together with you guys even if it's maybe not a huge 
um, upside from, from, from a business point of view, but I can learn a lot. I can, I can um, get into this industry and, and really show what I'm able to do. So our idea is really to have, have an ecosystem of partners who all get, um, get mentioned in the project, who all hopefully also get more business out of the collaboration which they're doing with us. So that's, that was the key, collaborating, get the right people on board and, and having, having a, um, a vision and, and the product which people really love and, and, and like working and contributing to. Excellent. This is a, an excellent part of the industry that needs, that needs to be shown how uh, you, you got to keep thinking outside the box, um, just like somebody else who is in a different industry, trying to make it happen from the ground up. You know, you have to go knocking on somebody's door, you know, knock, knock, knock and say, listen, you know, uh, um, I got this crazy material. I want to make my case out of it. I think it's never been done before. Uh, I know you make cases, you know, you, you get, you know, you, perhaps you get, you know, it's not like I'm asking you to do it for free, but, you know, if you want to be part of the project, you would get some more business out of it. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not BS that you're selling the guy on, but sometimes we have to get someone like that in because um, we're doing very low quantities, even at Mark's level. Yeah. Um, no one really wants to tool up uh, or even, you know, even if you have the CAD, it still has to be tweaked. It's still, it's still that per, every person who has CAD and brings it onto their machines and their code. And obviously I noticed because I write my own code and all that kind of stuff. We, it's still somebody else's shit. You know, we still yeah. have to get it into our machines are different. Um, the output code different. I got to sit for it's weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months and months or years and years in my case here of, of tweaking. So you got to you got to find friends everywhere you go to get it off the ground. But you know what? You all l later on, we, we do give that love back. If the company stays in business, that gentleman, you know, will pay him a little more. You know, he was there at the beginning and, and yeah. just like in our musical career, we all. We always keep those people who are part of our family. You know, if they if 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 they fuck us somewhere along the line, then they're they're not really in tune with what we're doing. We're not corporate people. You know, if they're that kind of mm -hmm. person, they really not need to be part of our family. Independent watchmaking really is a huge family in the forefront. But what we're showing here on this show is it's we're a massive family behind the scenes who really do. We're a loving family who are all helping each other, but sometimes you got to find that, that guy who doesn't know about us and we, we pull him in, and that's what Mark was yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's the same with it's the same with with, uh, with Mark Yeni with, with Andreas Strelo. They they they've been working over the years, countless days and, and weekends, and sacrificed so much for, for for us, and it's just it is incredible. And I think, as you say, uh, we we owe them a lot, and. Um, and I, it, it, it really is, um, it's just incredible to, to be able to work with, with such people together. Well, you know, you had, you had the same passion as, as watchmakers have. You know, we're, we're, we could be in school or wherever we are, we're, we're paying attention, but we're also looking at a cleaning machine that we, if we could only get this cleaning machine somehow, then I can do more complicated watches or whatever it is, or this tool, because our, our tools are so ridiculously priced. Hmm. You just regular tools, you know, I'm always talking about machines, but even our hand tools, you know, the, the thing you find out as a watchmaker very, when you're very young is you order all this stuff and you spend three, four thousand dollars and it comes to your door and it's in a box like this big. <laughs> and you, know, you open it up and, you know, it's like it's a needle, you know. So everything's very, very expensive. And you were sitting there at business school, you know, with one with two books open. You know, you had your drawings and your dream and you knew this bis even in business school, I'm not staying here, bro. I'm going to make this happen. And you did everything you could to make it happen. And that's what you got to do. You, you got to be out there. You got to be in it to win it. And you're definitely winning it. That's yeah. for sure. You know, because you, you went way outside the box. You said down earlier, uh, yeah. use an expression that you know, it's so multifaceted. And it just, there are so many different people, roles, there's the, the designers, there's the, the, the watch makers, the finishers, the, case makers, there's the, the glass, the crystal makers, the straps. There are the there's so many different facets to the independent sector that and, and people do have to come together that do have to collaborate. Sometimes they have to take a leap of faith in a, a young guy like Mark. Like to hear Mark's career history so far, the guy is only a youngster, you know, and he's <laughs> <laughs> So he's been through uh, 
a, a number of, of, of careers already on there. But to, 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 yeah. to find his, his passion and, and uh, to be able to, to, to follow his dream uh, is, is the result of all this collaboration with all these different people, all these different skills. Johnny, Johnny you did, a, did you do a couple of write-ups for his timepiece in the past? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see everybody? Johnny's a badass. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you gotta look up this this guy over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can check it out on the watch press for sure. Uh, and, uh, Mark, Mark, Mark didn't even stop there, everybody. Mark um, you know, he found Andreas, he found uh um Mark Jenny and other people to make his dream from a napkin not just come true, but his timepieces are selling very well. Um, but they do, more people need to know about the insanity that's inside that case. He didn't even stop yeah. there. A, a regular case wasn't good enough for him. He didn't do your typical round case uh, that everyone else does. He could have went down the street. He's in Zurich. He could have went down to the 7-Eleven on the corner and bought a case to put his movement in. They have him yeah. everywhere. And he didn't stop there. And he didn't stop just at a killer design. He hunted down materials that were extremely unique, uh, lightweight, um, cutting edge, more of what independent watchmaking is all about, finding shit in maybe another industry that uh, hasn't been used in our industry, combining metals, going to a dude who pours metals and heats them up and convincing him to mix metals. That's what we do. We're all a little bit out there, okay? Um, just like guitar players, if you're guitar players, the normal strings aren't good enough. You got to mix your set of strings. I use these three sets and I use this string, this string from this set and this string. From, and I don't like that pick and I want this pick. It's the same crap, okay? But this is micro mechanics. And uh, so Mark, if you could tell us more about uh, the case, uh, the process and you know those hurdles uh, and what, you, what, what you've accomplished, because I know you have a few materials that we'd all love to, to hear about. Sure, sure. Um, let, let's let's start off with, with, with the case itself, the way it looks like. It's a tonneau-shaped case, uh, which which was um, a case profile I, I've always loved, and I knew that that's the way I want to. Um, that's the case profile of of World Watch. That's what it has to be. Um, and and as you said uh, in the beginning, I'm going to overlay. I'm going to overlay. It's going to look really unprofessional, but I'm going to show you a watch. I've got a photograph here. So uh, we're all going to hide behind it for a moment or two. And uh, you can take a big swig of your wine as well, Mark. Um, but you can uh, continue <laughs> talking. <through. laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there's the, there's the, the, the V1 plus. Yeah. So uh, talk us to it, Mark. Okay, so the, the, the way the, the case looks like um, should, <laughs> should represent um, actually like, like a frame of, of, of an art piece, uh, which frames up the mechanics inside. And as you can see, we've, got, we've obviously got round um, components inside, like the dial and the movement. But I really believe that by having the tonneau shaped case, you actually have got a far more um, you've got far more depth to 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 the watch itself. Um, you can see from the sides how how the the cross um, the cross bridge mount is 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 fixed to the four corners, and and it yeah. just gives it from my point of view just an incredibly cool look. You've also got uh, what we call the number plates. You can't really see, I think, on this picture, but but number plates on, on top and bottom. So on the, the the bottom one, yes, here you can see it, Johnny. That that's that's the real plus red gold. Um, which which can also be personalized. So we use the the, the lower um, plate engraving plate to to um, to highlight the brand and and the the reference, and the top one can be personalized. I think what's interesting here is also just to um, highlight that the plates itself take a lot of time to create. Um, we start off in this case with, with with a gold plate, and then you can see that the writing is actually standing out of of the plate. So um, it, it's laser cut, um, and and based on on the on the technology used, you've got like a rough surface. It looks really cool in in the metal, obviously when you when you see it. And that's uh, that's made by by a company called Laser Factory, which have done an incredibly good job as well. So that was the first two two watches which we launched back in uh, in 2018 at Baselworld, and. Um, 
what what I uh, maybe a little side story. This case actually was uh, was also done by, by our, our case maker, obviously. And I remember um, a week before Basel World, he called up, and it was um, I think it was Friday evening, and I said, "Look, we've got a huge problem. His his uh, his Micron CNC machine broke down." Ah. Uh. It was Friday evening, and I can tell you, like a normal case maker would have said, "Well, sorry, hard luck. That's just how it is." And he actually he got a technician in, and they worked all through Saturday and Sunday to to make that case possible, which was just incredible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had uh, something to show. That was incredible. It just shows the the character <clears throat> of the people who who actually who who work with us. So fast forward to uh, to twenty seventeen. Um, I was uh, I was talk uh, sorry 20, 2019. I was talking to to um, to one of our patrons and we we're talking about customizing possibilities and I said look we can we can literally do nearly everything and um, we played with a couple of ideas and uh, inspired by uh, by Pagani Zondas uh, the the car uh, the Pagani um, brand and the Zonda cars um, I thought it would be incredibly cool to actually to get carbon and titanium together um pagani uses carbotanium in their in their cars um in the in the monocoques and, and i thought that would be incredibly cool to have that in our watches and uh, based on the idea i um i talked to our to our composite partner fat carbon who uh or videos who is a great guy and, and we we talked about this this idea and we came up with with, with the basic concept how it would look like and he starts to work on it, hand laying one prepreg pre -preg, uh, carbon um, page after another, and applying titanium. And um, so we, we, it took a lot of time actually to to create the composite, and then even longer to to machine it because uh, the first um, and and keep in mind we, we're making it for one person, so we had to get the blocks, the composite blocks, um, uh, in the quality we needed. And this was our first. Um, this was our first uh, carbon titanium uh, case. Wow. And it took 32 hours. Now, the problem was after 30 hours, um, a small piece, um, probably you can't see it, but a small piece here just split off after 30 hours of machining. So that was it. Um, we had to actually go back again and, and restart the process. And what we do is we are in constant contact with our patrons. They actually experience everything we're doing. So also the highs and lows, and if something goes wrong, we send it out. They, they, get, they get the full experience. Uh, it, it's, we, don't, we don't cover up anything. It's just like, that's what happened. We have to go back to the drawing board and, and start up again. So at the end of the day, we were able, as, as a small manufacturer, to create an incredible new timepiece, which was uh, the Weavon Plus CTI, um, with the world's first uh, carbon titanium case. And that was the starting point for, for special materials. And we moved on one step further. And I have to tell you that story because it's actually completely insane. Um, we did the, Vivo, uh, the V2 Plus um, uh, in, with red ceramic and carbon, which was launched um, at the end of last year. And if you if you might be able to quickly put up the the, the gold um, watch again, the V1 Plus Red Gold, as you can see on the picture, um, the case is curved. Um, or it's maybe a bit hard to see, but but basically it's got a curvature on 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 the, the on both sides of of the case, so it's curved in, in both axes. And I was really. I was, I was thinking about how cool would it be if we could stack the carbon um, for our latest project in a way which would emphasize the curvature in both directions. Now, if, if, you, if you quickly go back to the camera, it's a bit like asking our, our composite maker to, to not only um, curve the, the composite in this, in this direction, but also in, in this direction at the same time. So that you would you would you would see the the the, the profile will be emphasized, and uh, he probably also thought we were pretty nuts um, having that idea, but <laughs> he, he came up <laughs> he came up with an idea where he would actually hand cut every single layer of of carbon, <clears throat> and then create a special mold out of a CNC a CNC mold, um, which would allow to to stack the carbon and ceramic, the, the red ceramic powder, in a way which would actually allow us to have that curvature in both directions, and then compress it and bake it. And um, that was the idea. 
and he was uh, that was our luck as crazy as we are and he said okay challenge accepted um and he started doing it and it took 21 composite blocks until we had the final uh, case and it took over 40 hours just machining time to machine a single case and and as as you know Dan, uh, just mm. programming programming a cnc machine on on a composite which you don't even have any experience on is like it's a nightmare because mm -hmm. you've got you've got carbon which has got different um characteristics and mm -hmm. and ceramic it's a bit like you would take a, a drill and try to to drill a hole uh, in in a mesh of metal and bricks it's like mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to even find well, the right what tool. happened is be, uh, um for, for those that don't understand we can't just machine out of brass say, or stainless steel case or um, like now I'm making my entire escapement is completely all out of titanium, which has never been done before. We need different tools in the machine uh, for t different from titanium. And we run the machines at different speeds, uh, different what we call feeds and speeds, meaning that if the machine is going, you know, th this fast in brass, brass, you know, it, brass is soft. Think of brass as tofu. Okay. It's a block of tofu. You try, try that with titanium. It, you just, you know, you just sure. you just lost his. You lost eighty bucks. You lost eighty bucks. You pop this one. Here's another hundred and fifty bucks. Here's two hundred bucks. So three, four thousand dollars later, you learn really fast that you should slow that down. Now, what Mark's doing is he's creating a mix of materials. Okay, so that machinist has to go. What the fuck am I going to use with this? I got to cut this. It has some of ceramic. It has some of titanium. How fast can I go? How slow can I go? Meaning, Mark's not really looking for mass production and you know mass production cnc and not and, and not prototype cnc machines like we do we're not so concerned with speed mass mass production is um but he still has to figure out what's going to work within a relative time frame as mark said making one case that machine's got to run electricity for 30 some odd hours and at the very end you get a nick in the case you start over okay so you just wasted all that electricity and et cetera and so forth so it's a lengthy process is what Mark is trying to explain to you. Uh, it's uncharted territories. Not everyone wants to do that. In fact, almost no one wants to do that unless it's for themselves because it costs money, which means he's got to stop whatever he was doing, making money to put electricity, you know, put food on his table to do something yep. for Mark that might not even work in the end, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why a lot of us independents end up taking all our money and buying more and more and more and more machines so you all understand so we can take these risks because we don't think normal we don't think corporate we think out of the box and sometimes it's the customer uh sometimes it's the customer i don't know if this was totally in, in his ballpark but he might have come to mark and said i just want something that no one else has let's figure something out and we will do That's it, it. Sources. there you go there you go so, yeah, maybe our customers are fucking cool, cool for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's also like, you know, if, if people are under the impression that, you know, there's a huge amount of trial and error as well, because these watches don't just come, you know, oh, I think I'll do this, make the parts, and bang, it all works. Because mm -hmm. there are, as I said earlier on, there's a lot of heartbreak in it. And you yeah. say, if you can imagine machining and working and refining a piece for 30 hours, either maybe 32 or 34 hour project, and bang, a little crack, and it's, it's, it's fucking, yeah. you know? I, and, I, uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to create little, little uh, titanium miniaturized springs for my pallet lever. It's, it's never been done. This is like a, it's a titanium spring that doesn't even like exist. Yeah. Wow. It's yeah. like yeah. 0.02 millimeters thick. And I have to, I've, it's taken, I'm here like almost two weeks now, perfecting a way where I have to place it inside like a cocoon of other stuff. And then when it's done, it takes me about four and a half hours to peel this cocoon off without ruining the spring uh, um, and without my watchmaking knowledge, traditional watchmaking knowledge. I couldn't have done that because it's a combination and I'm holding these springs now. Now I can go and find someone with a wire or EDM machine somewhere and have these done and set up for maybe 20 thirty thousand bucks to set up fee and all that kind of stuff but if i can do that right here that's something that for me that's my choice i'm self-contained if that guy's place burns down i'm not out of business we all have our own way of doing things 
And, and yeah, that, that's the fun part of independent watchmaking, the creativity and part of our art. It's not about, hey, hey that guy doesn't make every single part in his house, in house, in house. He doesn't make the jewels in the hairspring. Yeah, I'm starting a yeah. hairspring factory. You know, it took Rolex, what, 100 and 200 years to open theirs. My mom would just open one down the street. Like, I don't think everyone really understands the complexity <laughs> of, of their separate industries within the parts within our watch. So we all have a different way. Of doing things. There's no right way, there's no wrong way, as long as there's passion, love involved, and we're doing, and it is our art, you know, that that's really what should stand out. And Mark keep, keeps pushing the boundaries here. Is the case you have and the materials, you know, you're combining is, it, it's killer. I just pity the dudes that you have to give this stuff to and say, dude, make it happen. <laughs> I'll pay you gladly for the hamburger I had today on next Wednesday. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> what sort of price points are the are the box? Uh, uh, if you're if an if a collector is looking to uh, get into uh, the the vault brand, what kind of uh, uh, price point are you talking about, Mark? So the starting price for, for bespoke watches is, is 37,500 Swiss francs. That's starting price and then based on, on the project. Um, so uh, in terms of what for material is going to be used, um, engraving, finishing of, of the movement, uh, coating, um, whatever that, that really then, then um, what kind of case uh, defines the price. What kind of cases the, the base model start with? So you've got you've got steel and titanium as 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 the bases, and um, it's a it's a closed case back, and then from there you can go to an open case back with with different finish on 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 the case back side. You can choose literally everything. We've got, for example, a great partner, uh, RC Tritech, who does all the um, all the Superluminova for us. So for an example, we've got um, our art piece collection where you've got where you use the sapphire disc, which indicates ours to create art on that. So like a, we've got like an orange paint splash. That was our first project we did. Um, so you can, and for an example, the, the, the V2 plus um, red carbon ceramic, that was made for a, for a collector who, who prefers to wear his watches on his right uh, arm. So we changed the configuration of the crown. We even did a new, um, a new hour indication, especially for him. And we actually created a new reference based on that. So he hasn't got a sapphire disc, but he has actually got a, um, a grade two titanium laser cut and hand finished um, uh, hour indicator, which we created together with him. And what's the pricing for the, uh, the ceramic carbon case? So that that's um, that's uh, the price on top. You mean, or like the, the additional fee to create that? So that's that really depends on if you're, for example, going with uh, with the curved one, which is like the most difficult one, and that can be obviously a price increase of that can be like up to ten thousand because the tooling cost, the time which it takes to do, um, is is pretty significant, as as you can imagine. That's extremely reasonable, actually. Very reasonable. Now, you, now I, I do understand there's no traditional crown or winding uh, on the timepiece. And I think what Mark, Mark Jenny is involved in, he's doing the rotors, is, is, or is he just doing the prototype of the rotors? Fill us in with what Mark Jenny is, has done, what he does. Um, is he still actually manufacturing certain parts or is he still in the, in the prototype realm? I'm always interested in what Mark's doing because he's a badass. Yeah, he definitely is. Yeah, no. When we when we teamed up with with Mark, for me it was like clear. I want to have, uh, I want I want to have parts from him as well, and I want to um, to to have him have the possibility to also add uh, something to to the to the world brands to the watches. So the the rotor, for example, is is designed by Mark. It's 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 engineered um, by Mark and created. And um, you might have seen on our website for the V2 uh, version, we've got beautiful engraving plates on the back side of the case, uh, uh, sorry, on the back side of the movement, which actually like they look like they're floating on top of the movement. And that's something really badass, which he um, developed as well. Um, and that, the idea was actually because we found out because of the material mix of the case, we couldn't laser engrave 
um, the specifications on the case back, it just it, it wouldn't work. It would look rubbish because the laser reacts in a different way to depending on the on the on the material. So we decided to to add two uh, engraving plates, which he designed, floating on top of of the um, on top of the movement, which um, are then they are laser cut and hand finished as well and applied onto wow. onto the movement backside. So yeah. so why why would you go outside of Andreas's shop to do certain parts with Mark? Well that was that was because uh, actually pretty simple because Andreas is, is is a really busy man. He has got a lot <laughs> of projects and <laughs> and, okay. and we and, yeah. and and we decided that um that the, the engineering part of, of obviously of, of, of the movement um, is and, and the general um, part of, of the watch has, has all been engineered um, by by Andreas. And then when he hasn't got um, any time, for example, to assemble the watches, then we we would we would work together with with um, with, with Mark. And that's just it's it's worked really well that we've actually been able to now. To, to split the work um, and, and have like best of both worlds now. So when, is, so, um, it's just so like so let, incredible. Let's straight for, for people that are out there and wondering how we get our shit done, um, not someone like me, but someone like Mark and, and many other people like him. Um, so if Andreas is a little busy, we're gonna find, you know, for, for the next six months to eight, six to eight months or whatever it may be, he's got a large project, then Mark will be assembling the timepieces and making certain parts. Am I correct in that realm? Yeah, we've we've actually done it now that 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 uh, Mark is 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 assembling all of the watches. Oh, great. So we've been able to really to split that that work like that, and it just it works great for for all parties, and and it's also it's it's of course um, as you say as as a small brand, it, it's just great to know that you're not going to get into any difficulty when somebody has just got a lot of other projects um, going on. So it's it's actually the best. Um, situation you can have as a small brand that you you're able to to work together with two great watchmakers who are able to assemble the watches who are able to manufacture parts for the watch and it makes just great to work like that well from a watchmaking standpoint what you have is the best of all worlds because what we yeah. strive what we strive to have is e even if you were to have two or three if i'm well eventually i have another say two or three watchmakers working here on my movement those watchmakers in the traditional way were trained and the way I would want watches built correctly is one watchmaker should build that watch from, from the parts, ground up. Yeah. Then there's a master exactly. watchmaker who is used to, has done inspection in his career at some company somewhere. Me, myself, I, I headed up Chopard for all of complications. So any other watchmaker had to bring their watch to me uh, once they cased it up and it was done for inspection, I send them back to their seat if there's dust in it and this and that, whatever it may be. Now, Mark is, is he's a badass. So you have someone not only assembling watches, but Mark knows he's been through, you know, into thousands of vintage watches. So if he's building your watch, that watch is not coming back. And if, it, if there is a problem, you have one of the best, you know, watchmakers around that, uh, you know, that knows what that problem is. And we can, you can fix that problem at the core of, manufacturing because more than likely it's not going to be his problem but that he, he didn't assemble something incorrectly so it's not um an assembly line of uh of decompartmentalized people putting your watch together like you know human robots which i am so against it's traditional watchmaking you've brought everything into your your business the right way and you, you you're doing it all the right way if andreas just says listen man i got a project i can't do another 20 of these right now you know you can get it done you're you're in switzerland it's a little easier than the rest of us once we step outside those borders so it's real interesting yeah. to see how this is done within the borders you know you're there to tackle it now for someone else who's thinking i want to be a mark how do i be a mark but I live in Yugoslavia, or I live in Japan, or I live in somewhere else. It's not that easy uh, to go down the street. But there are people you can contact Mark, you know Mark, uh, Mark, Mark Jenny, and there's other uh, watchmakers that do similar things. And that's what we're trying to introduce to this show here. And we'll keep introducing these people to you that there are these people who are ghost builders, okay? Like ghost yeah. songwriters. I've said this before. If it's your first time tuning in, a ghost. Builder is someone who really doesn't want to be known and they're very busy people 
some of the most badass watchmakers known to our planet, traditionally trained, usually 10 to 20 years of, of, yeah. of schooling and apprenticeship, and now they have their own place, and they're making parts for other independents, like Mark's brand, or they're making parts for some of the largest corporate brands in the world who may be trying to do some smoke and mirrors and say that they have a, a one-of-a-kind handmade piece or whatever it may be. It's not them making it, it's the ghost builders. All right, mm -hmm. so a ghost builder might be good at making gears. That's his specialty, they go to him. Another ghost builder is the CAD guy. Another ghost builder, I'll even say is a designer. There really are ghost builders because uh, he can work with CAD because they're used to working not just with CAD, but they're used to working with CAD that translate into watchmakers and watchmaking. And these people are all behind the scenes uh, giving love to independent watchmaking. <clears throat> an independent, excuse me, an independent watchmaking means, if you're not, you're not exactly sure what this means, is we, we can create our art with no boundaries. We don't have bosses. It is our art. It's just like the music of my past. You are getting a piece of us. And mm -hmm. the stories are so compelling. There are people who, who like Mark, who has given up everything. Uh, he's given up his police career. Uh, which I'm sure had a, the, that Swiss pension was probably pretty good. Um, <laughs> and, and then went back to school for business. Yeah, he moved on because obviously you're not sure, can I really do this? Is it really going to happen? I still need a backup plan. Otherwise, my wife's going to kill me. So but he was there daydreaming all day long, making it happen, and he made it happen. So it is possible. It is possible to find funding. Um, my stories that I've heard or nightmare stories, that I've heard across the board. I uh, won't ask anyone else to to put their timestamp on it because I can. I'm the only one that can pretty much speak freely uh, in, in this industry. Here is uh, if you don't have to take in investors, don't do it because I can pretty much tell you 99% of the time it's not going to last because our industry works very very slow, and they want their money very very fast. And it gets really slow. If Andrea says, I can't do anything for two years, you, you're going to get it done. It will happen. But that investor is going to go, I'm out after a year. He's gonna, I, I, you know, yeah. I, I need my 250000 back or whatever it is. He put in a million, but I need it back. I'm pulling, we're closing down. I'll take my loss and go away. And now yeah. all your dream and everything is done. So I'd like to save all of you a lot of time because these horror stories are everywhere behind the scenes, okay? It, it, I don't yeah, know you are. They're there. Yeah. It's better to ha keep your dream in your napkin, go real slow, go one step at a time like Mark did. He marks a very good story. Keep pushing on. It's okay, you know, go keep pounding your bank or wherever it may be. Uh, you know, yeah, it is okay to take in a little money, but go under those premonitions of this could be eight years, this could be 10 years, and get mm -hmm. it in writing that he can't pull and that he doesn't own that name fully because you're going to get fucked by the guy in the suit and the tie every single time. Yeah. I think that's an Absolutely. important point, Dan. You really have to be careful with, with, with the, the investors you, you want to work together. And I think you just, you have to be, you have to be honest and, and explain this is not going to be a return on, on investment in like in, yeah. in a matter of 12 or 24 months. And that's really important. And obviously, I think it's important to not take on too much money to try to do as much as possible on your own. And as you said, Dan, also take your time. It, it's any going to take time. And I thought I'm, I'm like the most, um, uh, let's say I'm, I'm I don't like to wait until something happens, but you learn pretty fast that you have to be patient in the industry. It just it just takes time. It takes we're, time. That's we're true. slow because there's many reasons it's slow. We're beyond perfectionists because you eventually, no matter who you are and how much money you have, you got to visit the watchmaker and you got to visit the master. Okay, and we're all have this OCD that's off the chart. And even if it's not for us, if we put our name on it and our time, you know, our, in our time into it, we're, we're, uh, we're traditionally trained and that's how we're trained. You know, if you went to school and you did hair springs, you know, you're sent back to your seat forever until it's right. Uh, so we, we were, we, the best people are the slowest people. That was very hard for me to do any kind of corporate work or work for any, any large, uh, company because I, I can never get anything done because it's never done. It's the same as my music. 
in music back then, you know, you, it, it, you had to get the money from the big record companies to go into the big studio and you had to hire the big producer because no one could run those giant mixing boards. There was a million knobs. Those guys had to go to school to run those $10 million mixing boards and they needed two assistants to help them know what they didn't know because every studio had somewhat of a different mixing board. So we had to hire all those guys. We, if we were there, every musician I know, we would be there in that studio and never come out. The albums would never, ever <laughs> have been completed. You think one Pink Floyd album would ever been done? Do you think that anything, you th they would have never left ever. There's always the guy that comes in with the money or, you know, and he just says, August 8th is the date because we're artists. Mm -hmm. it's, we're, we're never happy with the completion. And the second it is completed and we do, you know, August 8th is that date, it's out. We're still hearing shit that was wrong. We're still th thinking about things we could have done better, but somehow we have to put closure on that and put it behind us. And it's the same in watchmaking. Um, that's why there's version two, version three, you know, uh, let me add another complication to this or whatever it is. It's done, it's closed, yeah. But now there's a new period in our life. There's new ideas and there's a new napkin. And we move on. Or new material. So or new how do you explain all that to the guy who just gave you $2.2 million six years ago and you're still not holding the first watch in your hand? You can make a million excuses, right? But if he would have waited till eight years, he would have been holding the watch. But they, they can't. It's, it's two different mindsets. It's money versus art. And it it's really difficult to balance those two. Mark, you're one of the few people that have done that and you've done it in a very creative and unique way. You've been blessed immensely uh, to fall in the lap of some of what I consider the, our walking planet's best, you know, masters, you know, uh, yeah. how someone who's, who, who's did that, I don't know. Cause I mean, I think we all know how much money you need to walk through Andreas's doors. So um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. So it's, I find you very compelling, the story compelling. I think uh, the Vault Watch is a unique piece, completely different than anything I've ever seen. It break, it's breaking all kinds of boundaries and it needs to be way more in the forefront of independent watchmaking because I don't want independent watchmaking to be this cold place where it's just about people like me. It's, there's people with incredible stories who have given up so much to get where they are and it should be, uh, given not just credit, but these people should be around us for a long period of time. They should be helping other people like themselves um, with that napkin dream really get there. Don't help everybody. We don't have room for everybody. <laughs> you know, the few that are very, you know, overly passionate, uh, perhaps you're a collector and you really are at the end of your rope. You've, you've, you've spent all your money on, you know, in a wonderful collection and you really do want to make that next step of not just I want to own a brand, but I want my world, the world, to see my napkin. Um, yeah, it can be done, and and really, I, I, I think we need that Andreas Strella setup in my country, and I hope I hope I can bring some of that here. Yeah, yeah. you should, you should, and I, I agree. I think that what you said is important. That we have we have experienced incredible lost amount of support, and so many people have have helped us. It's like our obligation to also give back in in any way we can, and I think that's what what I mean. Obviously, we we are planning to be in for the long run, and I'm sure we're going to be. Um, and and it's it is it is our duty to also give back, or my duty to give back to, to so, other people where before, I can. Before we close, that that's wonderful, and you're giving back right here is what you're doing actually. Because this isn't a, I want, you know, a show where it's, I want to sell your watch, dude. This is not, you know, I, I'm only going to bring people on here where I think their stuff is badass. Um, but how is someone who does what you do coping with the times we're in now where there is no Basil show? There is no place where you can show your, what you do. You're, you're, um, you know, you're not a traditional watchmaker, you know, who's posting pictures from your bench each day. Um, you have product, your story is different than an independent watchmaker. Mm -hmm. so can you maybe, I mean, we have to be creative in these times. So how are you making it through this tough time? As we all know, until there's a vaccine for what's out there, it's going to be a little bit of a long haul here for all for the planet. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, good point. I think we, and, and I agree on that. I think it is, it, I would I would say it is easier actually for, um, for a watchmaker who who is running his own brand um 
want to do, I mean, let's put it the other way. If you are an independent watchmaker, you've built up your own brand, I think what you really have to do is give as much insight as possible. You have to uh, show the craft, the passion behind what you're doing. I would work with far more videos. Um, I think that that's something which you should really do. And in terms of what we have changed or how we are coping in, in the time we are right now, um, really leads me back to um, the fact that as we never had a big budget and we knew it's going to be like an uphill battle for the next five, ten years, we had to go down a different path. So from the beginning on, we knew social media is going to be our platform. That's where we want to where we want to be on. That's where we want to connect. That's where we've built a lot of a lot of connections to to um, to to collectors around the globe and and, and people like Johnny have. have first i'm pretty sure we had our first contact over social media so i think what i want to highlight with that is that we never really we hadn't a retail store boutique or we didn't go to the big we, we did go to Barcelona, world but we didn't have like the the big uh the big booths and all that stuff so we were already relying on the tools which now a lot are adapting to because they can't do a show so for us not a lot has actually changed I think what's what's important is that a lot of people, for an example, on social media nowadays are, are focusing on the number of followers and the number of likes. But what we did from the beginning was, um, and I like to call it like the social media iceberg. You've got what everybody can see on the top is the likes and the followers. But what we are really, really focusing on from the beginning was what's happening beneath the sea level. So where can we actually build relationships using social media? Not 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 likes for likes, but actually really relationships. And that's um, that has been something which is incredibly important for us to to build a network we have got now, and and that's what we're still doing. Um, so I think that the best way to handle in this crisis is to to share the story, show as much insight as possible, show behind the scenes, also show what maybe hasn't worked as good as it should have, um, because that makes makes small indie brands far more um, authentic. And another point, and that's something which we also had to do um, because of because of our our um, our um, uh, investment um, or or the. the a relatively small amount is we said from the beginning on we're going to do bespoke watches we are going to create watches when we actually when we have um a patron who is who is prepared to to buy a watch then we start the project and we create the watch we didn't create any stock um we we have got a very very lean cost structure in house and that's what what actually helps us to, to get through this this whole crisis brilliant so you have you have Mark's holding boxes of parts, and when you get an order, it's a custom order with the with the collector, and then assembly begins. It's very much uh, like the Japanese showed us how to build cars efficiently. No, you know, no parts on hand. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That that was actually thanks to to business school. I was quite inspired by that way. To say, okay, we have to make sure liquidity is always going to be a challenge, and we have to make sure that we. We start work when we've got um, a, a, when we've got a new a new order, and what we can give in return is is an unprecedented um, re, uh, experience in terms of what you um, what you live through in the three to four months which it takes to create your watch, and you've got a lot of customizing possibilities which other brands obviously can't can't offer. And we all have Johnny, you know, uh, independence, you know, just you know, I want just. Want to keep you know pushing that on on uh, whoever is listening how important it is to have people like Johnny who also believe in us and find us find people with unique product unique stories um, yeah. and and do write ups in magazines that we probably wouldn't have gotten into because uh, he can push it into the mainstream sometimes so at least there's a little bit of awareness of you know there is stuff way beyond your you know first people get money they buy a rolex and and then they get buy a patek philippe and then maybe they buy something else i need a tourbillon um and then they're like okay now what and really what we're trying to do is show them that beyond the beyond the beyond is independent watchmaking you know we're the guys that you bought your porsche you bought your mercedes you you know you, you 
you you you bought your Ferrari. What's beyond that? You know, do I a car? You buy a car and the car tuner guy. You know, it's now you're into McLaren territory. Now you're into independent watchmaking territory. Okay, that's really where we're at, everybody. Um, if you care about the name that's on your wrist, you're looking in the wrong place. This, that's not here. But if you care about what's inside your time capsule, you've entered into independent watchmaking because the movement and the mechanics is we're, we're, we're the best, we're, we're the, hmm. most of us have, have worked in the rooms of the corporate uh, watchmaking rooms with their most complicated pieces. And we've taken all their knowledge and we're sitting there thinking, I can make this better, stronger, live longer. And that's what we create when we have an opportunity to put our own name on our own product. Being at a watchmaker, <laughs> or be it Mark, and then Johnny, you know, finds it, recognizes it, and he writes about it in a wonderful way that I keep trying to speak. I'm not the best speaker, right? But yeah, like Johnny, take it, take it to the <laughs> next. Yeah, that, that, I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think that Johnny has has helped us tremendously, and the watch press and and people like. People like, um, I mean, if, if you look at, uh, uh, we've, we've been lucky to be featured in, in a blog to watch, in, in uh, Revolution magazine, in, so, so a lot of people have actually been, been supporting us. And I think without that help um, of, of people like, like Johnny, it would be really tough for us to actually to spread the word because it's always going to be something different if, if Dan or myself are talking about our creations because of course we think it's the coolest thing on, on, on the planet. But <laughs> if, if, if somebody else is talking about, about a watch and saying, oh, Dan's watch, that, that's just, that's badass, then that's something completely different. I think that's why um, what Johnny is doing and, and all his, his colleagues in the industry is, is, that, is that important. Yeah, and we feel, Johnny, uh, I'll let you speak in a second, Johnny, but Johnny came to me and, and Pietro, you know, and we all felt uh, all of us needed something like this platform, you know, someone where we could all speak openly and really tell the behind the scenes, behind the scenes kind of stuff. And I just want to keep, you know, give that thanks to Johnny. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's another one of those unsung heroes that needs to be not hung but sung. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm blushing here. Uh, but, so I actually, just, just a couple of points, and we are going to wrap it up. We're headed for uh, an hour and three quarters here. Um, is to say that you know the internet has been a great leveler for independent watch brands, and the same as you mentioned with with Ryan Adams, with, with uh, uh, Revolution, with Monochrome, with guys that got there. Uh, these are online magazines, and they're not like hard copy magazines. So you can't just fill up a month or a quarter uh, publication with so many pages. We're always looking for new content, and that has been a great thing to be able to promote the independent sector because there's a very hungry audience out there who want to be fed the information on these new and exciting brands. And we said, Dan, that you know, if you're looking for somebody's name on a watch, you're looking in the wrong place. I think you do yourself a disservice or a little because you guys are the masters. And you know, in the years to come, it's those names that will be hitting top dollar at auction and doing you know, the prestige that uh, is associated with, with being the elite of the elite watchmakers. And mm -hmm. so, uh, or, look, to have you guys here to be able to talk. And, about these things, about your work and your passion and your dedication and your broken fingernails and your sharp broken springs or cracked cases. It just it shows a real uh, humanity behind the whole thing, that it's not just some uh, you know, fantasy scene or situation, that these things are hard earned and manufacturing one of these watches is not for the faint artist. Um, I think we lost your sound, bro. Yeah, we lost your sound. Mark, right. Mark yeah, I can't can hear you, you anymore. Can you still hear me, Mark? I can hear you. Okay, I so can't, I can't hear Johnny. Yeah, what? Your sound cut off, Johnny. We're we're at the end, but we at the end, what we do is now we we have to ask you about your musical tastes. 
what you <laughs> what you grew up with when you're cruising around in your golf with the sirens going, <laughs> trying to arrest little metalheads smoking pot or something in the corner behind the supermarket, behind the Migros. What are you blasting in that golf? And what are you blasting now? <laughs> and what's Andreas <laughs> blasting? <laughs> That, that's, a, that's a good question. Actually, I have to say, just, just to start with that one, I, I think I've never heard music in Andreas' workshop. I only can hear the ticking off of, of the clocks there, but, but I think, I think music-wise, I couldn't really tell you. But, but, but in my case, um, I've, um, I'm 37 now, grew up in, in the 80s, um, 80s, 90s. Uh, for me, what, like one of one of the the biggest influences was was uh, hip hop music. That was something really big for me. Uh, so that that whole culture, um, listening to hip hop, playing basketball, on, on, and dreaming of an NBA career. That was like back in the days, like <laughs> one of one of uh, one of my dreams there. Um, and I think it, it progressed to, and I think that's probably true for a lot of people. The, the older you get, the more diverse. Um, your 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 music taste becomes so hip hop is still something which which I like um, I like uh, house music but what I really always enjoy when I'm just when I'm, when I'm working is is listening to uh, to chill out um, saxophone beats just to to have like a bit of like a chilled atmosphere to get to get into your flow uh, and to be able to to uh, to focus on uh, to focus on what what I'm working on. <laughs> So right. that's, yeah, that's that, that's what I listen to. Okay, so no metal for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've never really got into it, but you know what? I'm I'm definitely going to listen into your tracks afterwards. I want uh, to. Uh, I mean, I have to. I have to feel. I have to feel it. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea during these times because if your heart stops, is I don't know if you guys got <laughs> ventilators over there. <laughs> 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 oh man, it's real. You know, it, it, this was a really, really interesting uh, um, conversation, and uh, it's something that not many people would bring to the forefront to show everybody. You know how this is done behind the scenes by someone who is not a watchmaker, um, doesn't doesn't you know doesn't have that incredible dream to perhaps be one, but what is beyond that he has another dream. He's drawing on that napkin like someone else would would draw, you know, a design for whatever else they're they're going to produce. It doesn't have to be a timepiece. And he made that dream come true. And it wasn't easy. To, what he's produced, uh, Mark, what you produced with Duvall is is not normal. Even if it was a watchmaker to create it, even if that was my napkin, it it's. I mean, I'd probably have eight years of orders for it if my if I was doing that timepiece here which i have nine years of my own time piece so you'd be pretty close <laughs> <laughs> no it, it's that badass it really is it's it's crazy and, I, and it, it really needs to get uh more in the uh more press in the independent watchmaking scene and hopefully uh um you know I, i've helped that just you know hopefully like this much and to int introduce everybody who doesn't know who you are what a friendly loving and incredible guy you are because you assembled somehow an amazing team of other loving people who also like to give love back to the world and they've taken time out of their busy days, not just to make money off you and your giant multimillionaire investor or banks or whoever's bank, you know, behind you, that wasn't part of the game. They didn't need to do that. None of these people and names you've named today need to do that. Not one single person there. They did that at a, a different level. If you know that or not, but at this point you need to know that, that those guys didn't need you. They didn't need your project and they didn't need that money, they would have found a way through. And, you know, Andreas doesn't have any payments on his Willem and CNC machines. They're, they're there, right? So yeah. it's a blessing, and we all should be a blessing to others, and that's what this is all about. And, man, you're a beautiful dude, man. Beautiful dude. Good luck. And a, a, Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Likewise. Drink more beer, draw on more napkins. <laughs> Moral of the story. <laughs> I will, will do that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next, to the next uh, session, Dan. Absolutely. And Johnny. You Johnny welcome. can still hear us. Anytime, anytime you got something new to come back and, and tell us about, man, we would greatly appreciate it. It will be great. Looking forward to it. Well, we're just going to make sure that everything you told us is truthful because we're going to have Andreas on here. I'm going to find out. <laughs> You're going to find out. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm out. Guys, it's been great. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Johnny. We we still can't hear you. You have a microphone problem. All right, everybody. Okay. Peace out, Mark. See ya. Bye bye. Bye. Go back. Hmm. No. Um. No. 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 Here. Let me. Here. Um. On here. Yeah. End this. Stop cam, share screen. Uh, fucking news. Leave stupid.